discussion in Parliament at all. Is. To be fair to Councillor Rosenberg, he is naive rather than working in compassion, unlike some of his colleagues, and at least makes the effort to take part in some sort of discussion, unlike most of his colleagues. Uh, the Tory leader, Richard Cornelius, does not like to leave the safety of his comfort zone in the leafy, leafy avenues of Toddridge, but is recently obliged by the Lucy One Show to make an unprecedented appearance in one of the less favoured areas of his body in West Henry in the estate which she has previously described as grotty. The community now being all those down to existence to make way for the luxury of climate development by Barrett's. We know now that Barrett's have been given the land for free and are waiting for Barney Council to decant, to use that word the term, residents living there already or compulsory for purchase their homes at a price calculated by capital values below the point at which they can take advantage of the supposed share equity which is their only way of achieving the new homes from the original as part of what was once a genuine regeneration scene. It some of my neighbour in Cornelius, in his interview, stood rather gingerly in the unfamiliar surroundings, dressed in his silk cravat, displaying his typically cheerful, sometimes inappropriate, saturnine smile to all his usual nonsense, denying the really reality of the terrible circumstances facing the residents of West Henry. And in the face of all evidence to the contrary, claiming that the only occupiers are getting all share, all getting shared equity in the place, the secure tenants will all be housed in the estate as well, the temporary people will be accommodated locally. Cornelius seems to have forgotten that any perceived grottiness is directly the result of his own failure as landlord to maintain the estate, or does he seem to register the offence he might cause by describing people's homes in this way? This tells you a lot about this extent of disassociation he and his colleagues feel from the real impact of their policies, the disregard for people's lives, other people's lives, not people like us, temporary people, who can be decanted, dehumanised. Easy to have an easy council housing policy that deals with the destruction of the community of lost homes when you remove the human aspect of their stories, isn't it? These people, temporary people, and necessary to dehumanise the situation when you're committed to an agenda of not just gerrymandering, replanting entire communities with affluent residents, more likely to vote for you on the pretext of mixed communities, or when you are committed to an agenda of social engineering, an activity with which our Tory councils are now dabbling in their dilettante fashion. Yet again, the story of the Sweets Way evictions we're seeing by Tory housing policy in action, and that it's most shameful. Children and mothers and six sick residents turned out of their homes literally onto the street with no real care what becomes of them, just as long as they are removed from the yet another estate of quite a I should say that by chance I met two of us since who've now been evicted from their homes in sweet way. One was an elderly man with complex health problems who had a heart attack as a result of stress caused by the build up of the He was told to go live in Hanwell. The other was the mother of two boys who was given over the option of flat and grey park. Another temporary location on another circle of generations thing. She showed me the pictures of a absolutely filthy, squalid, disgusting flat she was expected to move into with her children. Just covered in dirt, damp, and broken windows. I mean, it really was appalling. Yes, only this week we again see Mr. Uh, Councillor Cornelius telling us that residents who are temporary tenants are being found new places to live in the area. Not true. Sure. This process has gone quite smoothly, despite the misinformation and scarcity of empty flats. Not true. Those who sell their homes will get a brand new flat to live in. The solid achievement of building homes needs to be recognised and celebrated. The new mixed areas are so much better than the old isolated council estates. Well, housing is a key policy for our neo thatcher councillors here in Barnet. Moving on from provision of affordable homes and social housing for those who need them to the principle of removing what they see as a dependence on the state, on council services, an absence of aspiration, a culture of failure. This is how to, a housing policy to rely on it has come to be a moral crusade of morality can be used in this context, value judgments, and the measurement of material worth. This is clearly reflected in almost every policy decision promoted by the current member of the housing. Tom Davy, an individual who revels in controversy and refuses to apologise for idiotic remarks such as wishing to see only well off living in this bar and hoping to see the penthouse flats of West End filled with Russian oligarchs. It seems to me we're travelling back in time 
beyond the golden era, so we know that our Tories are fractionalized values, it's not a reflection of judgmental politics of the poor laws introduced in the 19th century. If you are not wealthy, if you're poor, you most of them, certainly the undeserving poor must be punished and corrected. The creation of new social housing will only encourage dependence, they think, and not obstruct and self help. Access then must be restricted. Priority of housing allocation to those who can demonstrate what they consider to be a positive contribution to the community. And as we've seen in West End and the Lamb Street Sway, residents kept on long term, non secure tenancies, some of them more than a decade or more, so as to deprive them of all protection of what should be their rights and law to a decent standard of secure housing. And I really don't understand how that's actually acceptable in terms of human rights to be kept in that position. I'm not finished, don't worry, it's look, I'll speak. Um, those lucky people are right. So you can't expect to always to deliver a housing policy based on principles of social justice, but can we expect a labor party to do that? Well that's why we're here as the giving evidence commission. What can they do? It's easy to ask the question and speculate and formulate nice ideas of what we want. We've heard some of that tonight. It's very interesting hearing about cooperative But all of this is theoretical, isn't it, unless we actually are elected to power. None, none of this is going to let's be realistic, none of this is going to happen unless we gain power. And we're not going to gain power unless we have a clear message to voters about what we how we are different to what I've just been talking about and what we're going to offer that that is different. As Harold Wilson once remarked, the Labour Party is a moral crusade. It is nothing I absolutely believe this to be true. And I feel that sometimes in this borough we fail to communicate a strong commitment to that principle and we fail to engage with voters because of it. However, I think this really now there is a real recognition from the most Labour Councils for the need for change and move to address. Uh, to try to address some of the issues of this housing commission is commendable and I hope there's many people to support it, engage with it, it's easy to criticise it, but the only way to improve things if uh, the terrible housing issues is to stand up and do something about it. Um, I'm not here to, to come up with solutions except one or two points and we had the, the leader of the Hampstead Fulham Council, wasn't it, came here and made a very interesting contribution about um, how um, we've taken over his post. He looked in detail at some of the developments agreed by the previous Tory administration and shaping those agreements until the letter was changed by that to the tune of £26 million, which he's investing in, in, in housing. And here in Bonham, we should be able to do the same if by some miracle we achieve power. Um, the capital contracts, as Mr. Winsford, I'm sure, from the Tennessee, are a license to print money, not for us, the taxpayers. Contractors, and if the Labour administration is to take over, we might hope to see an a, a immediate re evaluation of contracts and a, a demand for revision of the terms of the agreement, which hopefully could turn all savings to the public purse. Um, can we finish now? Yes, please do ask questions. Okay, well, I'll stop there actually. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. So, do you want to go straight to one? Yes. <laughs> Well, I'm prepared to follow the press.
set the right cream, he can't stop the result. So we've got obviously we've got high house uh, price inflation, we've got active or maybe aggressive property speculation, we've got growing economy, lots of new jobs being created, we've got decline in social housing, low wage growth, and we've got austerity. And all of those things are leading to the housing shortage. And that is a statement that's leading obvious, but it's what we do with that evidence that maybe comes up with some solutions. So, um, very briefly, looking at the evidence, uh, the first one is about trading household tenures. In Barnet alone, over the last 10 years, actually there are 5,000 fewer owner-occupied properties. Um, and that's because of the aggressive buy to rent market. Now, that's, all that's done is drive up property prices. If you look at what's happening in central London, um, okay, you could say, well, there, there are foreign buyers. Yeah, okay, London's a cosmopolitan city. But actually, all of the buyers of prime central London properties are located overseas. They are overseas buyers. And that is overstimulating the property market. If you look at um, employment, between September 2012 and September 2014, there were 460,000 new jobs. Now, the majority of those were in the service sector, but all of them were created in the service sector. And that's because for employers coming into them, actually, the cost of entry is quite straightforward. They can come here, there's a ready workforce, more work, more people get sucked in. Um, and that stimulated the demand for housing. If you look at property price growth between, these are other estimates, between uh, January 2012 and December 2014, the London property prices grew by 31%. Uh, but if you just flip over to the next page, if you look at wages, actually in London they've grown hardly at all. And you know, we're talking about shared ownership. That's why shared ownership is failing, because the accounts just don't keep up with uh, property value. And again, you know, looking at what people are being paid, you know, everybody says we should be paying London living wage. I don't know how we can, can live on the London living wage. It's not a living living wage. It's an existence. Yet we're still paying a lot of people minimum. And if you look at the median, that's in that's in that's in that's sorry, that's in that that's right. absolutely, two hundred and sixty pounds a week. And if you look at the median rents, weekly rents in Barnet, you know, a studio is one hundred and seventy-three pounds a week. That's the median rent in Barnet for a studio. What this says to me is. We've got a fundamental problem in terms of having accommodation people can afford, certainly at the bottom end, where the service sector is. And uh, the last thing on the evidence base, to say a lot of this is lifted from GLA reports, lots of other reports, so it's nothing new. The issue about housing benefit, you know, one in four. London tenants who can receive a fund, some form of housing benefits. How we all pay for Every single person in the country pays for that, through the tax bill. And 90% of new housing benefit applications are coming from people where there's at least one person in the house that will work. So this isn't, a, this isn't about an employment, this is about working people who can't afford to live in accommodation. And the tax credit is subsidising employers. And, you know, they introduced the local housing grants as a way to, to try and calm the market down. It hasn't worked. The, all the evidence says it hasn't stopped rent growth because property is still going up and landlords and private sector are still whacking up the rents. So, that's the evidence. Everybody agrees on the evidence. That's not in dispute. From my perspective, the problem is that the actions that have been taken consistently fail to deliver the outcomes. Because I, I don't get the impression 
anybody has got a vision of where we want to be. I don't get the impression that there is any bold views. There's no blue sky thinking. I think there are lots of people saying that there are lots of reasons why we can't do things. My experience is there aren't enough people saying, why can't we do these things? And finding ways over those roadblocks. I've spent nearly 30 years in my consultant. And what I do is I find solutions and make them work. And I get the impression that a lot of people who are quite content to sit back and say, try that and it'll work. So I've got three simple ideas which uh, are radical. They shift control away from the developers who are pulling all the strings. And some of them are unpalatable. And some people will say, oh, I can't do that. They may be politically unpalatable, they may be socially but frankly, we're in such a mess that unless people start taking difficult decisions, we're never going to get out of this problem. So the first one, I call it, is the London Property Green. Now, if you look at what they did in the last budget to change stamp duty, um, it was escalated up for high value properties. Now, my view is there are too many investor purchases in London driving at values. If you were to set a threshold level, whether well, that's half a million quid, which is the end of the property, and say, right, okay, it's the equivalent of stamp duty on top, you can offset it against the purchase of a sole residence on the so if you're selling a house and you want to move, that's great. But if you're an investor buyer, that's taken off, in effect, like stamp duty, and that money goes to invest in local towns. Ultimately, it's all about where we raise the money. Um, now, it may be something which you say, we can't do it, we can't do it. Well, they recognize Because this is a fact on the purchase point. This is where somebody says, in Hong Kong, Singapore, I want to buy a flat in this new development on the Thames by, well, actually there's a 15% London property premium. If, if you're moving from a house already, fine, you can offset that. If the gap is too big, it's more than half a million quid, then you still have to pay. But actually, it's about stopping investors buying investment properties. I think that's so fundamentally So, next one, employers' property obligation. Now, Starbucks can come here and they can open up a hundred branches of Starbucks in central London and they can pay their staff, whether it's minimum wage, under living wage, if it's income, living wage, seems bizarre. But actually, what they are doing is they are being subsidised by the tax. Now, as was mentioned previously, you know, the NHS had housing which they used for their staff, police had housing, and they fought all that land off. Um, that to me was a tragedy because being able to offer accommodation, affordable accommodation, is a key to retention of staff and key to, to making the system work. Uh, so my view is, if you're a large employer, that's over 50, 50 employees, and you want to expand the business, you have to find affordable accommodation. Set up X percent of the person's salary, whether that's 35% or 30% or whatever. Um, and actually, if you get employers starting to get into the property market, because everybody says, look, the local authorities, we don't have the money. Great. The employees are getting the benefit. Employers have got to start stepping up to the market and taking responsibility in creating affordable housing for their employees. So you say to them, fine, you have to get involved in this. Now, they don't have to be, uh, don't have to be linked directly to the employees. It's not that tight a combination. But they have to fulfill their quota based on the number of jobs they want to create. Um, and they can use 
whether it's housing association or co-ops, stuff like co-ops is fantastic, whether they use them as the providers and managers of those. But if you start to get some really big companies involved in housing, they're going to drive property costs down because they're going to want to build a very cost-efficient accommodation. And there's some, some more there to, 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 um, to consider. But let's say, for example, if you employ somebody out of, who's already in social accommodation, then that offsets your employer property obligation requirement. That's great because actually there are lots of unemployed people who find it very difficult to get out of uh, unemployment because of the benefit trap they're stuck in. If this is a way to try and break that, that's something that might be, that might work all round. <coughs> the third one is about, I've called the Quarter Housing Partnership, it could be any local authority partnership. Down, 10 miles down the road, UK pension funds are managing two trillion pounds of UK pension assets. Now, they're always working. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm really sorry. They're looking for ways to invest money. I've spoken to them on major capital projects. They're desperate to invest. And actually having a local authority wrapper around the investment means that they can lend money at incredibly competitive rates. There are lots of opportunities. If you haven't got the developers involved, and if you can use land again, local authority land, as part of that, and in terms of um, cost-effective construction, and there are really great modular systems, I've been looking at some very recently, um, that can help provide incredibly cost-effective accommodation. So what can Barnett do in the short term? Well, my view is, in terms of the regeneration of states, you've got to stop the evictions because actually, once these schemes go through, they're set in stone and they can't change them. I'll come back to what Theresa said. It's about renegotiating with every single regeneration development you've got to say, hang on a minute, this, isn't, this doesn't work for us. We're not going to let it go ahead. I think Barnett could take a really strong role in leading and lobbying <coughs> other, local, other local authorities to cooperate because Barnet alone can't solve this problem. That's absolutely clear. It can only be done in London wide. And the last thing I'll chuck in is this is one of the unplugged ones. In Barnet, I think there are about 1,500 acres of farmland in Barnet. Mm -hmm. Now, if we want to get to be a city of 11 million people, are we saying we need to preserve farmland in Barney? That's mad. I'd see the end of the lot and use it for housing. But the thing is, you've got green belt, but, but we've got people who are in high density housing. You know, Totteridge, brilliant. It's preserved in Aspen because it's a conservation area and it's got green belt. Why the hell should they live in the lowest density? Uh, housing in the entire council and it's set for life. No! Let's share the pain.
be a more powerful. How would mayor youth powers we're, we're not actually the same thing, because that's the type of powers, and one of them would be potentially not right to for example. I, but the mayor would not have a mandate for that, not to do the manifesto or whatever, but unless you have the power, you can't do it. So that's one of them. But actually, there are quite a bit of other points, which is an interesting thing. It might be something that isn't an issue in, in, uh, in some of them, but it, it's certainly an issue in some of them. It's kind of thing is one of the things we had a presentation last year on which the Canadians made a comment that say looking at the housing benefits bill and everything else that we're, su we're subsidizing all pay. Absolutely. So there's benefits and we're subsidizing. Yeah. That's not the light bulb thing, you know. Yeah. And you're going to of course it's light bulb after that. I'm saying I'm going to take that forward. But it is in effect employers employing people at pay levels that the Canadian can't afford to live. And we are subsidising that through our taxation is a form of subsidising the employers that pay. Uh, the solutions, the, one of the solutions of that could be around about the same employers you have to pay in London a stake in terms of accommodation for your employees because you're not paying enough to. So, so actually, I think mean, it's, it's an interesting idea. <laughs> it's a very interesting idea. It's a very idea. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a different. There are no new ideas. Yeah. No, and also Rantry. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and that actually reminds me of South Africa, actually, in a vast amount of countries, you can't always hear there's some struggles with um, But certainly, the um, area of my expertise in uh, some of the telephone people's there uh, had sort of challenges that were housing association driven. And, and, and when my spy came in, they were decimated. And I think that's, that's one of those challenges. One of the appeals, I think, to how often because you can protect that from subsequent sell. Because I think that was a real problem. And it was, a, it, was a, it was an innovative project because um, a series of workers had come down and sold when they started with the new set of paper. Um, but it did mean that ultimately those houses were the right time um, and were lost to that public sector housing. But so it has some merit, but I think it all, I think it has some advantages. I was wondering about this um, I mean, I like that idea about companies. So, I mean, when we think about people on very low wages, very low, it's the only thing we can do. And we need to change our economy model completely. Because everyone's being outsourced, so on zero wage. I mean, I don't agree with that. I wish I could just see what happened. If it was more outsourcing, more, you know, if it didn't get it right. We could have some very perverse effects. Um, and it's, I suppose it's a higher earning, but still not very high earning. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to benefit from it. But the, the issue about outsourcing is, is easily addressed because ultimately whoever employs those people has a responsibility. So if the, the employer outsources it to a capita or a Serco or whatever, Serco pick up the liability. It's still a liability and they can't avoid it. Actually, they can pick up an awful lot of 
but unemployment that's, that's there and be unaffected. It's the big companies who are abusing their position, their market dominance, like the McDonald's and the Starbucks and those people, who, who you know, they're playing the system already. Let's make sure they pay their <coughs> Interesting how you would stimulate, you know, there was in the past keyword housing was something the public sector provided quite a lot of police officers. I mean, police officers used to be housed in sexual housing and nurses still are sometimes, but it's very rare. And I think it's a it's a sector that's not had any I you know, if you could provide it might well be that what you're proposing, none of the major would buy and take up cash and seem to have too many. But actually, how do you incentivize the boys to take on the issue of housing and maybe through the tax? You know, there might be other ways of doing it. But if you are an employer and you're actually quite housing, you know, it, the, 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 there are advantages to that. It's not possible. Uh, you could get tax advantages, other advantages that make it worthwhile in doing that in London. I mean, I'm just saying, I don't know there are other versions of what you're saying. But I, I'm, not, I'm not sort of, uh, no, it's just uh, it does seem to be one of the things that, that I think we would be was very short <coughs> selling a lot of the public sector a QR housing because we we're now fairly hard to recruit people and we end up selling the Spanish. Yeah, the
octagonal forces like that onto the big communist <coughs> actually means that you don't necessarily need to have national government change to have to do it because the sort of money you're talking about means that it's in the contractor's interest supposedly to do whatever it demands of them and to make it domestic. So, so think about ways in which alongside that, to have some of the lives in order to be made larger in London wise in order to contracting out very, very large services, if that is the way it works, or if that is here, here to stay, then, then think about how, how the council could be instructed to add these clauses within this business, within large contracts. Hi, I'm Jeff Hawkins, I'm the Chief Thank you very, very 